What do you make of the general tenor of dialogue in the country right now? I think it's ludicrous and self-defeating. I think that everyone should reread Fahrenheit 451 <laughs> because if uh, some people might recall reading it in high school and mm -hmm. they think of this uh, the, the tyrannical government uh, that is forcing the burning of books. And of course, the some of their, their main characters, but you have these firemen who are in charge of burning books. And what many people cease to realize if they reread that book, which they will rediscover, is that it was actually the people in the beginning who started the burning of the books, mm -hmm. books that would offend any minority. And I don't mean that in a racial group, uh, a racial sense, a, but a, a minority population uh, began to be burned. And this is, this is very, very, uh, very dangerous. And I think a very slippery slope where you have effectively and uh, I've, I've seen a number of people remark to this effect. You have the majority of smart people who could discuss a topic and have the necessary uncomfortable conversation in a rational way opting out yeah. because the personal downside is so high that it outweighs in the minds of these people who could actually catalyze a lot of good, the, the, the collective long-term good is not sufficiently compelling to take an almost guaranteed short term, or I should say immediate, not short term, it could be very long term, but immediate personal hit. Uh, so I, th I think it's terrible. I yeah. think it's, I, I think, I think it's the, the biggest, the thing that scares me most in the United States right now is, is by far and away, not what some leader from on high would necessarily do to us. It is what we are already doing to ourselves. And that is disinviting brilliant people from speaking at universities because they might they might offer opinions or positions that would make students uncomfortable that's the whole point yeah I mean, how are you going to handle macroaggression in real life if you can't handle <laughs> different opinions from your own in an academic setting it's ludicrous so that uh, yeah i get i get pretty lit up about this because i think it's i think it's a very insidious problem that is in some ways being viewed as a solution and it is it is certainly i think not uh, beneficial in uh, in the long term at all yeah you hit on a bunch of my wheelhouse stuff there but i think the most interesting piece of that is that what you're saying is basically good people who could really change the world who could change people's minds get involved that they're not because of the personal cost how how can we unfurl that i mean i've tried to bring on people here and and, and get to some of this but I know, and I can see it sometimes with guests, and I'm sure you can too, you get to a place where they can't go any further. They just, there's a cost of them talking about something, even if they're yeah. an expert in that, where they go, now I'm veering past that red line and oh, I could yeah. get into some trouble. So how do we bring that back for those of us that wanna have responsible conversations? And open discourse, well, there's, so there's a word that I've been experimenting with, uh, creating odd words and inserting them into the common vernacular for mm -hmm. uh, about two years now. Uh, one has made some rounds. This is, this is one I did just for fun, uh, but you'll, you'll see where I'm going here. So it's, it's teleadultery. And teleadultery is when a significant other or you watch a TV show that you've agreed to watch together. You watch it by yourself. That's, mm -hmm. that's teleadultery. So that, but that traveled. Here's the important point. So that term traveled all over the place and then we were i was actually sitting in an airport overseas with my mom and she said oh here's a funny word you would like and it was in a magazine and it was tell <laughs> it was tell adultery this is word i'd created yeah so there's a word that i currently i think that it's very if you look at the the actors in this uh suffocation of free speech or discouragement at the very least of of open discourse you have, I think, on many sides, what some people have called social justice warriors uh, who throw around terms like racist, sexist, bigot of many different types very loosely. And those terms uh, can have lasting damage even if there's no evidence associated with them. Uh, so the accusation itself mm -hmm. becomes the conviction. And the term social justice warrior is not neutral in the sense that it sounds positive. So there really isn't any linguistic punishment uh, equivalent to, say, racist 
that would discourage someone from behaving in such a haphazard fashion and in a way that can destroy careers, marriages, you name it. Uh, so the term that I came up in a conversation with Eric Weinstein, really, really brilliant mathematician, physicist, mm -hmm was uh, this term bigoteer that I thought of. So bigoteer is uh, clearly not a good thing. It sounds terrible. And it is someone who calls others bigots for personal gain. And that personal gain should, could just be attention. Mm -hmm. It could be absolving themselves of guilt. It could be click-throughs. It could be yellow journalism and uh, irresponsible media just aiming for clickbait and click-throughs. So I think that if bigoteer were, were to become a real term applied to people who use these terms very loosely that uh, it sounds silly, but I, I do think that words are, what we lack right now are effective words and labels to discourage this, uh, this behavior. So that's, that's one that has come to mind as big a tier. I, I don't think until we have some type of disincentive uh, from behaving in a way that cauterizes or just stymies free speech that we're not going to get very far. So the humans just respond to incentives. I don't think humans are necessarily bad. We're just creatures that respond to incentives. So you have to figure out how to set the carrot or the stick sufficiently to get the behavior you want. Yeah. Are you saying we're almost like every other animal on this earth? That's exactly what I'm saying. Incredible. Well, I love the phrase bigoteer and I've used it a little bit, but you know, we're going to try something as of today. I'm going to use a little bit of what they call the Tim Ferriss effect, which is that when, you know, when you've had people on your show, usually their book sales go up or their clicks go up or whatever yeah. it is. So we'll try a little something. I'll push out bigoteer from today going forward and let's Perfect. see if we get a little Tim Ferriss effect on that. Because you're Definitely. right. You say social justice warrior, sounds like a good thing for someone that yeah. doesn't know really the underpinnings of what's, of what's going on there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's let, let's do it. I'm up for it. All right. So let's shift a little bit to your podcast because we are both creatures of the interview. How am I doing so far, by the way? You're doing great. You're doing great. Whew. Okay. All right. Very good. So did you always think of yourself as an interviewer? What made you want to do the podcast in that form? I always thought of myself as an experimenter and a teacher. I always thought I was going to teach ninth grade, actually, uh, because hmm. I was very much influenced by mentors at, I think, a very crit critical juncture. Uh, around that age, I think ninth, 10th grade, kids make a lot of decisions they don't realize you're going to take them down one promising path or down a bad path. But I digress. The, the, the point is that I view interviewing as a tool in the toolkit for extracting specific details and tactics that I can then impart to my readers, mm -hmm. uh, who are, I guess, my students in this case, for replicating excellent results. That's it. So I'm, I'm trying to tease out the cliff notes and interviewing, asking good questions, asking good follow-up questions, letting silence do the work at very specific points is how you extract that gold. And with, without the ability to interview well, I can't do the research that I need to do. And the podcast, I never expected to do anything. Uh, it was really a commitment just to doing six episodes so that I wouldn't quit. I made that public pronouncement. I would do at least six <laughs> episodes so that I'd be held accountable. And I wanted to work on improving verbal tics. I wanted to improve the selection and follow-up related to questions and to become a more active listener because I knew that even if the podcast cratered or I didn't like it and I quit – those were skills that would transfer everywhere else. And uh, this is something that I actually borrowed uh, ultimately and really developed after Scott Adams uh, of Dilbert fame. Mm -hmm. And he calls it systems thinking instead of goals thinking, but thinking of how you can win even if your project fails. And the way you do that is by focusing on developing skills and relationships that transcend that and persist over time. So that's that's really how I thought about it and why I got into the audio game. But I was burned out on books. I wanted to take a break from big books. And here we are. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear that. I'm curious on the on the follow-up question. I, I got a follow-up for you, which is how how scientific is that for you? So if you have a, a follow-up prepared, someone hands you the answer that basically you expected do you always go to that follow-up or how willing are you to, to go out there? Because I find that to be a constant 
battle sort of, of me wanting to yeah. just have a, the natural flow of a conversation versus I also want to hit on certain things. I don't want to let them off the hook on certain things. I, yep. I let people hang themselves. That's my method instead of <laughs> shouting them down. I think that's a little more of your method as well, <laughs> which is what I'm doing yeah. with you right now very subtly. Oh, yeah. No, I feel like like an invisible midget is strangling <laughs> me at the moment on my back. Yeah. You're naked choking me. But no, the 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 question I think has very personal answers. And, and the reason I say that is if you study some of the people best known for asking questions, say Larry King. So Larry King very often goes in doing next to no homework on his guests. The rationale being that the guest has no familiarity. I'm sorry, the audience has no familiarity with the guest and mm -hmm. he wants to start from where they are and asking the basic questions. Then you have, say, uh, James Lipton of Inside the Actor's Studio. He has every question scripted in advance, and he never deviates from his order of questions. Period. End of story. He knows the answer in some form to every question he is going to ask. So you have them on, on opposite ends of the spectrum. In my case, I don't necessarily have set follow-up questions, but I do have a handful of questions, which I've borrowed from other people, that very often can turn a a mediocre answer or a decent answer into a great answer with a few extra details and layers. So you might have somebody ask them a question, they respond, and then you say, what did you learn from that? Super follow, easy follow-up question you can ask almost any time. Right. Uh, how did that make you feel? That's another really easy one that is kind of a layup oftentimes. And uh, I don't go in with a completely set agenda. I'll give you an example. When I was interviewing Margaret Cho, a comedian, I thought we were going to talk about We've got her next cup. week, so this, this is going to be good for me. Oh, she's awesome. She's awesome. Yeah. She's great. So, so we were talking about the craft of comedy and so on and handling hecklers and so on. You should ask her about that. Yeah. And we, but we ended up bringing up and touching on addiction in comedy, drug addiction specifically. And that, that took us to a really interesting place. And if I had been stuck on script, we wouldn't have explored it. And that ended up being just an incredibly fertile ground for discussion. Yeah. Uh, so I try not to be too fixed, uh, but I do have my pet questions that I like to ask, as we all do. Yeah. Have you ever been offended by a guest? That's one of the things that people ask me a lot, that how can I sit with someone who maybe is against gay marriage and I'm gay married? Yeah. How can I sit with them and even if I hear their rationale and they're not yeah. being mean to me specifically, how can I tolerate that conversation? And to me, it's like, I may not like it, but I do have to... The whole point of an interview is to try to understand why someone thinks. Has someone ever said something that truly offended you? I'm sure they have. Nothing's jumping to mind, uh, but I'm sure that that's the case. Uh, and it makes me think a, a bit of advice that I got from Stephen Dubner, author of Freakonomics, or co-author at least. He collaborates with Stephen Levitt. And this, uh, I kind of went into a few different aspects of this in Tools of Titans, but he said it's very important to put away your moral compass in the beginning when you're trying to problem solve, especially when you're c collaborating with other people. It doesn't mean that you absolve yourself of moral decisions and judgments, but initially, if you if you want to put if you want to generate as many possible solutions, including non-obvious solutions or lateral thinking solutions, that you want to take the constraints and assumptions that you live with all day long and try to set them to the side. When I'm interviewing someone, uh, let's say, could be Glenn Beck, right? I live in San Francisco. Uh, if I'm interviewing Glenn Beck, if I'm interviewing, uh, well, let's just say General Stanley McChrystal or Jocko Willink, mm -hmm. so both from uh, extensive military backgrounds versus someone who might view themselves as a extremely... Uh, let's say, hyper-progressive slash liberal pacifist, well, they're, they're going to have opposing, opposing viewpoints on a lot of things. But what, what my, I view my job as extracting politically neutral uh, or apolitical routines and habits and so on that people can use. So one of the mistakes I think that we as humans tend to make is that we throw the baby out with the bathwater. We say, well, I disagree with so-and-so on X, so I'm going, to, I'm going to assume they have nothing to offer me. And that's a huge mistake, and it's a very costly mistake. So whenever I'm talking to someone, I have some of my friends I disagree with vehemently about 
let's say nine out of 10 of their core beliefs, let's just let's call them political beliefs. Yeah. But as long as they will engage in a debate and not try to shut it down with name calling and nonsense, if, if they're willing to dance with that and spar and admit when they've changed, if they are able to absorb new information and consider new evidence and change their viewpoints accordingly, in some cases, I have no problem spending time with those people. And in, in fact, I think one of the biggest mistakes we were talking about echo chambers in Silicon Valley is that if you surround yourself with people who hold all the same opinions that you do, well, you're going to get very comfortable with comfort, but it's not going to force you to consider, say, devil's advocate positions that are diametrically opposed to your own. And I think that's an incredibly valuable practice. And some of my friends are the first people to call BS, even in a group setting at a dinner, like, like Naval Ravikant. I love the guy. Uh, and I feel better. I feel every conversation we have, I come out of having improved in some way. Mm-hmm. He'll be the first person to call me out if I throw out some position or, or strong stance without evidence and rationale to back it up. Yeah. Um, so, and don't you relish yeah. in that? I mean, I think oh, actually, I, love it. I, love it. I think yeah. most people truly do. And somehow we've sort of been tricked or dumbed down to the point where we think if anything goes a little against us, that we have to lash out. And that's so not, that's so not fertile ground for, for growth. No, I agree. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things I try to do uh, at least once a week, but preferably much more than this, is to be the weakest person in the room at something. Right? I want to be in the room, and it's going to lead me probably to feel insecure, maybe um, insufficient, but whether it's training in a sport or picking up a new skill or sitting down in a room where people are discussing could be anything, molecular biology or politics, where I feel like I'm in over my head. And uh, that is how you average up. And I think you also average up by surrounding yourself with people who can intelligently debate and not just use rhetoric to try to corner people, but to actually go toe to toe with logical arguments, at least based on their own assumptions. I think that's, if, if you want to become smarter, and by the way, like the race doesn't go to the, well, the fittest in this situation means most adaptable. And uh, I think that is, is the cornerstone of everything else. Yeah. What do you make of this new idea that everyone seems to think that they have to have an opinion? on everything. Like, if you look at Russia right now, whatever is going on with Russia and the election, we don't have to get into the minutia of it, but it seems yep. to me that people who I've never seen talk about Russia before, who I don't think are particularly informed or smart, everybody's got an opinion and must share that opinion. I'm for the free speech yep. part, they can do whatever they want. But just this idea that everyone always has to share everything. Yeah, I mean, they, they probably couldn't place Russia on a map. Um, yeah. So the the... The, the, the great gift and curse of the internet uh, is that everyone has a voice. Now, that means every smart, people has, every smart person has a voice. <laughs> also means every idiot has a voice. And uh, uh, more and more, and this is in part because I go out of my way to expose myself to people who know more about many, many domains than myself. I find myself, it's not pleading the fifth, it's different. I will say... I don't think I'm qualified to have an opinion on this. Mm-hmm. I say that in the last few years, my the frequency of me saying that has just skyrocketed uh, because I don't want to have a strong opinion where I can't back it up. And so I think that it's fine to have an informed opinion, <laughs> but there's informed confidence and then there's uninformed hubristic stupidity. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I, tr- I would hope that people would lean more towards the former and away from the latter. But alas, in, in, a, in a media culture where uh, the eyeballs and ears tend to gravitate to the most outlandish argument imaginable, uh, it, it seems that that tends to get a lot of the attention. But, yeah. Are you ever tempted by uh, that, that click portion of this? You know, we know very easily we could title our things differently and probably triple the clicks. We could use 
misleading yeah. thumbnails. I mean, you know, all the games of the digital world sure. that plenty of people are playing. Have you ever been tempted to do any of that stuff? You know, I, 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 in the beginning, in the beginning, I mean, when I had my first blog, and if people out there want to laugh their asses off, they can look up, uh, just Google Tim Ferriss' first blog. It is the most hideous, <laughs> disorganized, terrible mess you've ever seen on the internet. It's it's really atrocious. And at the time, I was told I had to mimic this person and how they did X. I had to do 12 posts a day before noon to have any hope of A, B, and C. It was, there were all these arbitrary rules, and it was a Me Too game of mimicry. So I, I did try listicles and all sorts of stuff that on some level works, but it wasn't me and it had no evergreen value. So I've, I've been rewarded, thankfully, for trying to put together really comprehensive material that lasts, not only lasts multiple years, but the real estate, if we're talking about print, let's say, mm -hmm. actually goes up over time. So my, my, my Google real estate appreciates over time. And some of my most popular posts were written five, six years ago, and they still drive the majority of traffic to my blog. Uh, so I have been tempted at points to do that. But ultimately, my fans, are, I'm very fortunate, very smart, generally very well educated. They are very vocal. So if I try to pull any of those shenanigans, <laughs> <laughs> I get punished very quickly for that. So it's, uh, it's good to be held accountable. Mm -hmm.